get that. So yeah. So long story short, you don't need to use um, responders <laughs> for cameras. Yes. Um. And you can use <laughs> Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, very great. Yeah. Yes, I I have you know, definitely visited all those um slides. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Yeah. The thing is, like, you don't. Um, it's still gonna be a time exam. <laughs> yes. So you might not. You're not gonna have. If you haven't studied at all, you're mm -hmm. still gonna do poorly because you can't look up every single um mm -hmm. question. But if you have been reading and you took notes on everything, <clears throat> which is what I recommend, um, then you, you can actually go back and look through your notes for things. Um, or alternatively, like if you studied really well and there's just one thing you can't find, you might be able to look in the book for it. Mm -hmm. But it's not that you shouldn't study it mm -hmm. at all, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, you should still study, take notes, review everything. <clears throat> And at least know where everything is in your textbook. So if you need to refer back to it, you can easily pinpoint the information. And I would say um, that would be most true for the um, the article, uh, the Levine article, and then um, the Five Reasons by Triandis, which is part of your like chapter one. Class notes, and I believe it's uh, in your textbook as well. Um, in both of the textbooks, in terms of like the methodology or the introduction um, sections, I would be very familiar with those because you have a essay question on them, and so you want to be able to not not just know the five reasons, but also be able to explain them and give examples of them. So those are the the two things, the Levine article and the five reasons for studying cross-cultural psychology researching it. I would be really familiar with that. The rest of it is more heavy on, um, it's more heavy on the developmental theories. So I would especially, um, like especially the uh, cognitive and intelligence related theories, especially Piaget, Piaget and Vygotsky. Mm -hmm. Those two I would be pretty familiar with. Um, and anything to do, yeah, just in general, the language, cognition, intelligence, it's pretty heavy on, on that material. Um, and then just the general, like, goals for the field of cross-culture, like the point of the, the whole field and why we study it and what it studies, stuff like that. Um, but still, know, know, the, know the other developmental theories, but the, the Piaget and Vygotsky are, like, the most important. So everything on... Um, on um let's see actually i'm so sorry i told you the wrong thing so actually originally i had three essay questions mm -hmm. but i believe what i did was i cut it down to two so you'll mm -hmm. see that number two on the review it says review surprise and confusion comparison mm -hmm. on page 129 mm -hmm. I actually decided to make that your essay question. So actually the five reasons given by Harry Tran is, is going to be part of your multiple choice as well. Um, so actually, sorry, I forget what I said about that one. I would review the Levine article very carefully because you're going to have an essay question on it. And then I would review the Socrates and Confucius comparison. The Socrates and Confusion comparison, there's not like a right or wrong answer. It's really just kind of your own philosophy on how you view perception and thinking about the world. Um, but just be ready to kind of like justify your answer and give good reasoning on that one. Mm -hmm. Yes. That was a lot of information. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> we are in college, so I totally agree with you about, you know, being able to identify all those major um, psychology um, professionals. And yes, I, I also agree with you when you uh, talked about how um, some students don't um, study if they know it will not be on responders and then they will be able to read the book. But I totally disagree with that because we, um, we 
of course need to be well prepared regardless of whether the book is in, in here or not. Mm -hmm. They're not like definition heavy questions, so you're going to be kind of in trouble if you try to find every single answer anyway. <laughs> so that's where I, I try to make it so that it's like, it's not a complete easy way out, but you're also not forced to memorize things that you're going to forget right <laughs> after you take the test, basically. Yes. So because now that I know uh, Levin and... Uh, Harry Confucius are uh, most important. Um, it, does it mean that you know those, uh, what was it, Bride Wealth and then Marshall article? They will not be on our midterm. So um, I would still. So kind of like on number four, you see how it says you're you're kind of be prepared to answer questions on like research methodology, mm -hmm. um, methodological strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. These are things that, um, the reason why I had you guys do the practice worksheet and the worksheet mm -hmm. on those two other articles mm -hmm. was to get you prepared for basically being able to do something like this. Mm -hmm. So I would actually, um, I wouldn't totally disregard those articles. What I would do is maybe go back and <clears throat> and look through your assignments and see how you identified different um, weaknesses and strengths and method methodological um, approaches to the studies um, and make sure like, you kind of see the feedback I gave you about what mm -hmm. was expected. Mm -hmm. And that actually can help you um, score better on the free response question um, about the Levin article that's going to be on the midterm. So the the material, the actual the actual um, articles themselves, like the topics, aren't going to be tested. But what you had to do in those worksheet assignments is the same thing, pretty much that you're going to be doing mm -hmm. for this question. Yes, makes sense. So I. Um listened to Bron Fen Brenner's Ecological Theory of Development. Um, and it, uh, it feels like the, I mean, I, I just have one sentence of uh, comprehension. Like it, it basically means our e ecological, I mean, environmental things affected our circumstances so that it uh, talked about something like um, poverty cannot be you know blamed on one individual person um, what else was the main um, summary in this article scale 
So, like, it would be kind of like your school district or your entire neighborhood, you know, and then the macro system would be kind of like even bigger concepts in society. So it would be like kind of like the legal system mm. or the, um, or like public policy or kind of um, issues like maybe like colorism. Does that make sense? And then like your corona system is like even bigger. It's maybe it could be kind of like big movements that involve like many countries and like, um, or historically significant events that kind of almost are on a like, global level. So I would kind of note that part of the model as well. Um, just to kind of, just, I mean, you don't need to know like every single example, but just have a general idea of how each level of, of this model works. Um, does that make sense? Uh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Yes, I uh, I get uh, why um, it is arduous for you to describe because cross cultural psychology, as you know, is very um, very broad. Like um, we are not just comparing each. Uh, I mean, it's Asia with Africa or uh, whites with Africa, but we are looking from so many different angles. So. Makes sense. <laughs> um, do you have any questions about the the questions that I answered in the email? I don't know if you've had a chance to read through. Oh, I I didn't have a chance to read yet. I was just okay. uh, sk skimming through, but um. As long as I did well on you know those qu quizzes, I. I believe, I mean, I'm optimistic that I am well prepared. <laughs> you are, I think, it sounds like you are. And the questions you asked are definitely kind of next level questions. And so <laughs> they're, they're great. They're great that you're thinking about things like that. I really actually liked um, the question you had about the big five, <laughs> whether it was culturally valid or not, because that's actually a really big question of debate. And the the big I mean people a lot of personality psychologists maybe you know this from personality psych that you you took mm -hmm. but a lot of personality psychologists kind of want to expand beyond the big five and they have I mean we have the um oh my god I'm, I'm blanking on the name 
the hexa something like they added one other dimension of honesty mm-hmm. and humility to the big five basically and that's kind of seems to be that that might be the new big five big six basically um but then there's so much so many other scales and like personality assessments that measure so many other things um i use like for my dissertation i actually used um i used the culmination of a lot of different um value system tests that that really took into account um cultures and that was kind of a big emphasis of my dissertation and it's just it's really hard to pin down one assessment as being like the the best or you know the most i i mean the, the biggest issue with the big five is that it's so it's oversimplified like there's like five traits mm-hmm. and you're kind of trying to like describe a person in five traits so most of its critics argue that it's just really not enough to really get an accurate profile of a person <clears throat> mm-hmm. but it is i mean it is like statistically very valid <clears throat> and there's like tons and tons of meta analysis and meta meta analysis that support it <clears throat> it's been around for a really really long time and consistently the data supports it the data shows favorable favorable results for it mm-hmm. um but but like everything in science like it's not permanent and i think <clears throat> there's like a there's a big push to get away from it for a lot of people or to develop beyond it somehow um so i think it's a really excellent thing to look into because like you said maybe culture and maybe it's not actually culturally valid there's a lot of studies that look at that and, and criticize it for that um <laughs> So yeah, I, I really like that. I think you're thinking the <laughs> right train of thought. I don't I don't know if you're you've already developed your honors thesis topic, but that would be kind of interesting to look at for something like an honors thesis. <laughs> Actually, thank you so much for asking. So, um it yeah. shows me um uh, you care about me. So, I ended of up mm-hmm. Yes. I um successfully um got one faculty advisor and then um she she and i um will be doing something about educational psychology so um things like um those with you know physical disabilities like myself and then um uh, each variables so um social exclusion or stigma you know those things in relation to um, having physical disabilities uh, that's my um broad um area where i will do my honors research great that's awesome i'm so happy you found a faculty you only need one faculty mm-hmm. yes to okay that's great that's yes good. i hope um do you get to like present it in front of a committee and everything i don't know how it works um I I think it depends on um which project. So like I I know some other students who are doing uh you know um what's it called um senior in- integrated project or senior internship and then what I'm personally doing is just um honors thesis. So most likely I think I will only, you know, have a mentoring relationship with that one faculty and probably not, you know, publish or uh, announce in front of the whole college. <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay, but well, that's still great that mm-hmm. you have the opportunity to do that. That sounds like a fantastic topic and the fact that you you can personally relate to it makes you more more passionate about it to you and it's super important of course so <laughs> that's good I'm glad you found somebody <laughs> I was thankful uh, for your um anecdote uh, right now about your um thesis. So my curiosity is um which field within I mean subfield within psychology was your you know master's uh, thesis in. So my um I, I was talking about my uh actually my 
PhD dissertation, ah. but um, mm-hmm. both my master's and PhD were in um, organizational psychology, mm-hmm. industrial organizational psychology. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so the, uh, organizational psychology also deals with a lot of cross-cultural stuff because, mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know how much you know about IO psych, if you've taken IO mm-hmm. psychology class, but yeah, I mean, you do you are dealing with organizations from all over the world. And so you do, it's a really big part of the, um, the field itself. It's not as theoretical as cross-cultural psychology itself, mm-hmm. but it's, it's more applied. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I study. Yeah. So did, um, you as a IO psychologist, um, also perform research or only just work in the workplace? Uh, what, what do you mean by that? Oh, so like I, I was curious if IO is a, um, you know, some fields within psychology are um, primarily workplace and then um, some other fields are uh, research oriented. So that's... Okay. Mm-hmm. You can you can actually do both, or you can choose one or the other. So um, yeah, you can be, become a full time researcher and be like a, a tenured faculty somewhere and do research, or you can work for um, the government or research organizations, mm-hmm. or you can just work applied. I mean, either way, even if you work applied, there's always some level of research you have to do. You still have to create assessments and survey people. Usually, like, you're still dealing with some research, but yeah, it's like a applied research um, in that sense. But yeah, you can do both. Um, mm-hmm. You can do either or. That's the that's part of why I pursued IO psychology because I didn't know if I wanted to work applied or work in academia and just do research. Mm-hmm. Um, so it gives you that flexibility. And uh, are you thinking about pursuing um, anything? specific in psychology? Mm, I am most likely to pursue um, either educational psychology or EdD. So um, what it means is um, specifically higher education administration. Okay, okay. Yeah, they they can overlap definitely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so okay, that's good. Yes, because you know, school setting or college setting is um a part of you know organizational you know structure uh, and then um i remember from my previous uh, psychology classes that um io psychologists on average they uh, earn more financially than o- other uh, subfields because io is a um, quickly growing field mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> Mm-hmm. And, and there, oh, there always has been, it's always been a very applied field compared to other soft sciences, but also um, a lot of IO people, even if they do stay in academia, they can work for business departments, mm-hmm. which pay twice as much as psychology departments, mm-hmm. because um, business programs, like, are, they don't have, they usually don't have PhDs, like, they're just masters, so they pay Mm-hmm. Um, they pay their faculty basically through that, and mm. yeah, I was great for that. I was very, it can be very lucrative. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of growth right now in mm-hmm. diversity, equity, inclusion kind of jobs. I mm-hmm. deals a lot with that. Uh, that's a huge segment of growth, and then like people analytics is a really really big mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you've heard of people analytics, but yeah, it's pretty. Fa- it's very. It's growing fast, but I imagine education is also growing fast because mm-hmm. it's become, I mean, education itself, like higher ed is growing mm-hmm. quite a bit. So either one, I mean, they're great. They're great fields and they can be a good service to everyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. My rationale behind wanting to pursue something around the educational or, you know, higher education kind of field is because I am personally a disability uh, advocate so what it means is i am 
very passionate about standing up for the rights of others, civil rights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I uh, totally agree with you that uh, more uh, students need to take cross-cultural psychology because you know, no matter which uh, workplace they go into, um, they will always uh, come from someone from another culture. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, culture can be ever anything. Um, like having a disability in and of itself, and having a community of others with disabilities can be its own culture. You know, like there's <laughs> any any kind of community that you're a part of is a culture. So it like applies to you to everyone on a very personal level. But then it also trans. That means like, um, for a defender's ecological model, that means like it's not just personal to you. Because if it's just your community, then that means it somehow is related to something at a larger level, um, so that it becomes part of like um, the legal system and public policy, and it just starts to be, yeah, it starts to be really involved and complex and connected to everything. So I'm glad, I'm really glad that you're taking this class and you're you're so passionate about it and you're enjoying it. Um, you. You're doing great, and it's great that you're an advocate for people with disabilities. That's awesome. Um, I wonder, do you uh, do you have any kind of are you part of anything um, through KSU, like any kind of student association, or have you have you gotten involved in any way with that? Mm -hmm. Thank you for um, this curiosity. So I. Uh, thought about you know joining um, clubs or organizations and actually back in 2022 I received an invitation to uh, the induction of um, you know Psy-Kai you know psychology club through KSU but then because it um, it uh, makes me pay additional fee and I just didn't know if it's mostly a scam or <laughs> reliable you know what I mean it, many organizations they, they just recruit members but then the members don't do anything um, hugely meaningful so I ended up not joining and I'm I'm just in the honors college right now in addition to doing honors capstone honors college means I have other activities outside of, you know, these normal classes. So what I do is every Wednesdays I have honors class meetings uh, where we discuss things like critical thinking, um, uh, potential uh, future occupations, and um, building a LinkedIn profile, you know, those kind of things. Yeah. That's great. Well, that's great in and of itself. Um, I was just looking up actually to see if, I guess KSU, I'm new to KSU just <laughs> a month or two um, with them, but I don't think it's not like, it's more of a, you know, what we call like a commuter school. So mm -hmm. it's not, doesn't have, I don't think the most rich like campus life kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's not super doesn't have a whole lot of like student associations and everything like that um, <laughs> otherwise yeah I would be it would be so cool to to join some kind of student-led organization or effort um, in that sense just so that you can it, so it can be something just outside of academics you know because I know honors college is very much <laughs> it's really focused on academia itself <laughs> um, but yeah I mean it would be nice to I mean, I, yeah, I don't know how possible it is with Kansas State University. Um, I think maybe, like, the Student Affairs Office might know more about, mm -hmm. like, a list of student associations that are out there um, mm -hmm. with KSU. But when I was in, um, when I was a graduate student at University of Houston, I actually founded um, a graduate student association for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and mm -hmm. we did a lot of, we were really on top of things, and we we saw that the graduate department, the program there didn't, um, and the psychology department, they didn't really do 
do a whole lot for diversity and inclusion. So we kind of took matters in our own hands and and we did a lot of things. We tried to create like a kind of um, make it more um, possible for traditionally underrepresented students to get mm-hmm. into graduate programs. We held workshops for undergrad students. We we did even surveys just of the of the department itself to see how how students felt about how inclusive the environment was and how um, how much the department did for diversity, equity, inclusion. It was it was a lot of things we were doing, but um, it's very that type of thing. I mean, since you are like an advocate for people with disabilities, that type of thing would be not just really empowering for yourself. Like it feels good to to be doing something like that, but also. Mm-hmm. But, but also, um, obviously, it's a great, uh, you know, something on paper to show uh, for just future employers or graduate schools that, hey, like, I'm, I, I'm really serious about this, you know, and I really, like, I've done things to make it, make it work, and um, it's kind of proof, like, more hard proof of what you're passionate about. Mm-hmm. But then it's just, like, I'm just throwing out ideas, mm-hmm. um, I'm sure you have a lot on your plate as it is. It's not easy to (laughs) take on so many things. But that's great. That's awesome. Um, Seems like you're quite um, involved. Mm -hmm. Yes, I... I uh, greatly appreciated your recommendation. So what I... um, uh, The thought that popped out in my mind right now is perhaps I will apply to, you know, some, some form of summer semester i mean right now because it's um in the middle of uh, fall so like i do not have more space for other things but then for for when i'm on you know summer break i feel um it will be uh, great to you know have either volunteer or internship or um Mm -hmm. job uh, opportunities yeah Mm -hmm. i mean sure mm-hmm. like it can be outside of ksu and yeah i know it's it's not easy being, mm-hmm. being a student so you know you have a lot on your plate i'm actually gonna um send you i just found a link mm-hmm. um maybe i'll email to you that's the best way mm-hmm. it actually has all of the student organizations student mm-hmm. or faculty organizations at ksu mm-hmm. um maybe you can find something on there that you're interested in but let's see um mm-hmm. I'll just send it to you just in case, because I didn't know in case you had such a thing. Yeah, I just sent it's like it's through your Owl Life account. Mm-hmm. Um, I think students have that as well, right? The, mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, okay, okay. Yes, yeah, so you can see what KSU has. And, and this is the. Or I, guess, I guess you can just go on the organization website mm-hmm. themselves. Yes, I actually visited that um website last week. Okay. Mm-hmm. So um yes, KSU hosts um events uh every week, but then um not all are um pertinent to psychology majors. So for example, some events events that took place last week were about you know computer Adobe <laughs> and then you know those things okay. yoga. Sure. <laughs> so like we have to do a very great job of you know sorting through um, which ones are uh, pertinent to s- uh, psychology. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I don't see. Yeah, they're kind of very specific to the majors, or they're <laughs> just like fraternities and sororities, which are mm-hmm. not. Um. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I'm looking through it right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's always um. You know, if you're up for it, if you have the time and energy, there's always the opportunity to create something that's not there mm-hmm. yes. yourself, you know, mm-hmm. so, yeah. Yes, and I... Actually, I was a part of, I mean, I'm just kind of a temporary mm-hmm. faculty with KSU, otherwise I could get more involved too, but mm-hmm. I don't know how long I can be with it, with KSU, mm-hmm. like for now I'm only with KSU until May, so 
Mm-hmm. I can't really get too involved with things, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But, yes. Yeah. Yes, I remember um, about your message about um, yearly contact. So I am um, assuming that means um, professors are uh, okay to leave KSU whenever they want, as long as it is in May and then they normally have um, they are normally employed at uh, other universities at the same time, correct? Exactly. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, currently I teach both for U of H and KSU, so I'm teaching mm-hmm. like um, a total of um, five classes for KSU and two classes for University mm-hmm. of Houston. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Alright, uh, Cheryl, do you have any other questions? Oh, yeah, yes. This is great mm-hmm. getting to know more about you and everything. Mm-hmm. Thank you for having this call. And again, sorry about um, not holding office hours. It's just I sit there and like, no <laughs> students ever show up. Mm-hmm. So for years I've done that and no one ever showed up. So I was like, okay, maybe I'll just I'll just wait until someone really needs to meet with me. Which is usually <laughs> the case. And they usually email me and they're like, can we set up time? And it's mm. just more efficient that way. But um, if you prefer, if you want to have weekly meetings we can definitely do that um we can even do it at a time that's more convenient for you or we can do it on fridays at during my office hour times however you'd like um or if not then obviously that's fine too just let me know just to let you know of my schedule i am mostly uh free on all days except for wednesdays because like I talked about the honors college, my honors college class conference. I mean, what I call my class is we actually discuss with, you know, those scholars during class. So like I have to be actually uh, present and attentive to, uh, you know, the Wednesday afternoon. So like, um, (laughs) so um, except for, I'm most likely, as you might be able to tell from the first impression, I am most likely the one who attends um, every week, uh, regardless of what day. Because um, in my other, you know, I'm in like six different classes right now. And and then um, in those classes, I have uh, um, made, you know, um, what was it called? Um, very um, rapport, so s- a strong relationship okay. with each professor, and I go to their office hours as well. Uh, luckily, this semester my English professor is so so brilliant, so great that um, she is um doing a um an honors project with me about uh, feminism in. Turkish culture and then um, it's a um, approximately 10 page APA paper and um, our plan is to hopefully I mean it's not um, it didn't go through their um, I mean the departmental verification yet but if I get approved I will be able to actually publish my paper on the new uh, world Literature Journal. Wow, that's mm-hmm. amazing. That's huge. Yes, I just like experts. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's so great. Wow, wow, wow. Yes, and so like uh, what I the main takeaway I'm getting to is, I um feel um even as an undergrad, if I publish or do something with my uh, whoever professor. Um, you know, this mentoring relationship will, uh, of course, pay off in the long oh, run. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, it's just, I mean, yeah, it's important in life to form as much connections, you know, mm-hmm. authentic connections, of course, as you can. Mm-hmm. Um, but just again, in, with your professors, I mean, that will take you so far. There, so many opportunities come your way, they'll help you just get so 
been so, to so many places. Obviously, mm-hmm. there's like recommendation letters, but like they mm-hmm. they can help mentor you. They can. I mean, yeah, it's really valuable. That's very smart of you to um, also mm-hmm. not you know. But and it, it takes effort on your end too. And so it's like you're you're um, putting in the work as well, and you're getting what you're mm-hmm. working for in the end. You know. But that's very good, and I'm, I have no doubt you will do just fine in graduate school and beyond and, and all of that. So really excited for you, Cheryl. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, I try to be cautious with this uh, curiosity, but because your last name is, you know, Zamani Per, mm-hmm. um, it made me curious, um, is it... Um, relevant to you know turkish culture because uh, for example um in iran there is you know hasan poor you know <laughs> those kind of similar last names mm-hmm. so i i was just curious about if you um later came to uh, the us just for education or you have always um uh, been a us citizen Um, yeah, actually, I'm, I am from Iran, um, yes. I also lived in Turkey, oh. um, so I, yeah, but I, I came to the U.S. with my family when I was really young, mm-hmm. so I grew up in the, in the United States, but mm-hmm. I was born in Iran, and, and we, we came as refugees, actually, mm-hmm. um, because of, um, polit- like, religious persecution, basically, my parents' religion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, so we, we lived in Turkey for two years mm-hmm. and as refugees and then kind of were, were guided towards the U.S. as our final destination. Um, so, yeah, I've been living, living here since I was seven. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, it's no worries to ask. Me <laughs> yeah, <question>. yes. <laughs> I, I, yes. <laughs> I was cautious so that, you know, it doesn't... Um, <laughs> sound to uh, yes I, I was cautious because some you know some people um uh, it, it is their secret where their originality is from uh, sure. <laughs> right. yes yeah it's a little complicated for some people mm-hmm. no but um uh no yeah i'm from iran and mm-hmm. i've i've been actually living kind of out of the u.s for, for a while and then mm-hmm. i came back to the so I've been a little bit all over the place, mm-hmm. but um, I'm here for now. And do you mind asking where your country of origin is from? Uh, my hometown is Turkey. Oh really? Wow. <laughs> so that's why I that's, that's why I know all these. Uh-huh. Yes, that's why I know all these you know things about how last names sounds because um you know um. Turkey, uh, because you lived in Turkey, I'm also assuming you speak you fluent Turkish language, do you? No, I, I was so young, like, I ah. remember, unfortunately. It would have been nice if I, <laughs> if I remembered, but no, I didn't. Yes. What's so weird is, you know, back then people told us not to learn <laughs> Turkish when we were there uh-huh. because it would make learning English too difficult for us, <laughs> so it's, it sounds really bizarre but like we actually intentionally didn't learn Turkish ah. two years we were there so I'm, I'm so sad and then we came here and we were like why did we listen to that advice and it's not even true um but, but I remember my sister learned a little bit but yeah I didn't because we weren't allowed to go to school or anything um mm-hmm. and when we were living so we I don't know what part of Turkey you're from but um I we were in a really small town mm-hmm. called Nefshahir, I don't know. If oh, you know. I know it. It's near Cappadocia. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so we had like a little community of other Iranians who were mm-hmm. Baha'i. So that was like my parents' religion. Mm-hmm. And they're really persecuted a lot in Iran. Mm-hmm. So, um, so we just kind of hung around with other Iranians um, as who were refugees. And we couldn't go to school and we couldn't go to work either. Mm-hmm. So we kind of were like... We couldn't really integrate much there, um, and then we were also told not to learn language, so it kind of, yeah, unfortunately we didn't learn much Turkish, but 
Mm -hmm. now that I'm looking back I'm like man I wish that would have been said and Farsi and Turkish are actually quite Mm -hmm. similar so it's not even it's not that hard to Mm -hmm. to get it to grasp it Mm -hmm. but um maybe one day yeah so you you speak fluent Turkish obviously Mm -hmm. yes from there Mm -hmm. I'm awesome I'm not only bilingual, I'm actually multilingual. Oh wow, you speak how many languages do you speak? So, um, uh, the, I mean, not the minor ones, but uh, fluent three are in Turkish, Korean, and English. Wow, okay, amazing. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. Um, and what city in Turkey were you, were you from? Where did you come oh, from? Oh, yes, yeah, so I, I'm from... Both, I mean, my childhood is from Istanbul, the biggest city, and then my adolescent years are from Ankara, which is the capital, but it's the second biggest city. Yeah, and I can remember both Ankara and Istanbul, really cool cities. That's mm-hmm. amazing. Do you go back? Do you visit um, when you can? Do you have like family or friends there still? Um, so my plan is, um, my mom thought about buying a house in Turkey, but then because, you know, um, in early in 2023, do you remember those, you know, um, worldwide news about er all the earthquakes and, you know, economic depression because of that, mm -hmm, it messed our plan. So like right now we do not buy any house in Turkey and we are still um we are still optimistic that um some someday in the future I might um live long term in uh, Turkey again well, mm-hmm. yeah that's so awesome so oh my mm-hmm. I'm most um uh, impressed by your anecdote about how um Despite the re- refugee background, you went on to PhD at University of Houston. That's a <laughs> breaking news, really. Yeah, oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, but because I think it's like a lot of times, um, maybe like you, you can relate to this mm-hmm. since you have a background with disabilities, but like mm-hmm. when you come from adversity mm-hmm. in any way, it almost pushes you to want to, to to be more successful or want mm-hmm. to like strive for greater things mm-hmm. especially when you feel a sense that maybe like other people don't have the same privilege as you and mm-hmm. um you almost i don't know for me it's like that's mm-hmm. what it was because in, in iran baha'is aren't and i'm not even baha'i myself but mm-hmm. you know like my family really um suffered a lot because they were baha'i there and so mm-hmm. they're not allowed to go to college or anything um Mm -hmm. so it's kind of like a big big thing for us to to make that happen because it it was something we were denied of like education was something we were denied Mm -hmm. of so Mm -hmm. it's really important to make use of it while we can and so Mm -hmm. I'm really grateful for for being able to do that and it's kind of I don't know like it, it was kind of almost always expected thing for me so <laughs> so it's not a surprise but yeah I appreciate that <laughs> yes I'm in the same boat as you when it comes to you know adversity because of my adversity I feel it made me stronger and more um more chasing of uh, opportunities yeah wow that's and do you mind me asking um was your disability something born with or something that happened later in your life mm-hmm. thank you for your curiosity so i i actually have both so one of them was um and like visible to others at birth you know visible means it, it is uh, physically um you know pathologized mm-hmm. and then um there's the other two are um, later diagnosed. So like later diagnosed means um, back in adolescence uh, when I was, you know, middle school and high school, I, one of my disabilities was, you know, this is in, invisible. So like other people cannot tell from uh, seeing me. Uh, what it is, is I get uh, chronic diarrhea. 
so like uh, how it impaired my um on campus uh, school life back in middle and high school was um uh during class time uh, if i go to the restroom and then teachers wonder um uh, where is she and you know those things and then be um taken to hospitals for my um sometimes there are even days when my diarrhea is so severe that i couldn't you know get out of bed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well that's um yeah i can't imagine that's very difficult mm -hmm. and it really like yeah it affects your your mm -hmm. life mm -hmm. in tremendous ways i imagine mm -hmm. but the, the fact that you are still it takes a lot to like mm -hmm. pick yourself up and like push yourself sometimes it's kind of like the only thing you can do you have to like almost um you almost have to to be like okay look these this is the situation i can't do anything about it necessarily mm -hmm. but i can make the most of my situation and be the best person that i can be the best version of me and you just put your best foot forward you know and you just kind of you kind of move forward you know mm -hmm. so yeah that's really and very pa powerful um mm -hmm. yeah really great that you're you're being such a Mm -hmm. So committed to your studies and, and mm -hmm. your goals and everything. That's so awesome. Mm -hmm. One more thing I am um, comfortable, I mean, I don't mind sharing is because of my uh, chronic, you know, daily diarrhea. I am actually on medication to control its frequency. Okay, okay. And mm -hmm. does it help? Does it make mm -hmm. sense? <laughs> yes, yeah, so there there was one time I mean last week the uh, during my English professor office hour <laughs> I I suddenly told her uh, like I suddenly disappeared so she was wondering uh, what I'm doing and then I was like <laughs> oh I had an emergency come up and then you know those awkward moments like <laughs> I, I told her, I actually told her, oh, um, now that I'm revealing my disability, I get chronic diarrhea. And then she was like, oh, I cannot imagine how you're living because, you know, if, you know, um, a part of, um, I, I feel uh, not just uh, those involved in psychology, but what I feel um, between faculty and students um, need to have is empathy you know the ability to put into uh, another's sh shoes so that's what she was doing like she was imagining if it was her like she cannot ima imagine <laughs> that's what she told me yeah. so it was really yes. uh -huh. yes. friendly <laughs> oh no go ahead uh -huh. yeah no I, I, my um my boyfriend's little sister mm -hmm. has um she has like celiac disease, but but she, I think she might have some other mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and she just was diagnosed with it recently. And mm -hmm. for her, it's kind of similar. Like anything she eats, mm -hmm. pretty much anything, even if it's not, um, if even if it doesn't have like uh, wheat in it or gluten in it. Mm -hmm. Um, she pretty much has to immediately go to the bathroom and, and sometimes she just, even if she doesn't eat anything, she has mm. to go, she, she has basically chronic diarrhea. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, I, we went on like vacation together mm -hmm. not too long ago and I just, yeah, I could, I could see how much <laughs> struggling with it, you know, it's not easy. Like it was, it kept her from, and cause she's new to it, like maybe you've mm -hmm. kind of gotten a better handle on it at this point and you have medication that helps you a little bit but she's mm -hmm. like she doesn't really have much of a much of a what do you call it anything to help with it at the moment mm -hmm. and so and she, she's new to it so for her mm -hmm. it's like it's very difficult to adjust so I've seen it like I've seen it firsthand you know so mm -hmm. when you said that mm -hmm. it is actually big it does affect your life quite a bit mm -hmm. Yes, a very great uh, stories uh, because um it also um uh, made me curious about um you know um I I did not personally take a class called psycho uh, pharmacology or uh, psychology of medicine you know those kind of things.
Oh, yes, sorry, the connection was lost. Mm -hmm. So, um, what I'm curious about is you as um, um, a PhD holder in um, industrial organization of psychology. I know it is different from, you know, medical or clinical psych, but what is your personal opinion on putting children on, you know, this psychiatric or, you know, diarrhea, those kind of medication? So mm -hmm. just because like I, I I think that it should be I guess a choice. Mm -hmm. I mean with kids it's a little hard, right? Because mm -hmm. they don't really get to choose themselves, so it's mm -hmm. on the parents to decide. Mm -hmm. Um personally, I mean, I think if it if it makes life a little more bearable and easier mm -hmm. for a child to help them, mm -hmm. why wouldn't you, you know? Mm -hmm. Um some parents I know think that it, it hurts the child more than it helps them and that's mm -hmm. their reasoning for not wanting to give any medication whereas others mm -hmm. you know they're they see how much their kid is suffering and they want to mm -hmm. alleviate that suffering and, and I mean with some with especially with specifically psychiatric medication mm -hmm. because it's relatively 